Oh, hello.
I just love that song. So last night when I was talking about, you know, that bullshit over, you know, what's happening that, you know, what's happening within certain communities. Oh, that was really, really, really difficult to get through. Um, <clears throat> and then I got a notification with the new radicals. Um, someone liked a comment that I made and I just love how the singer says this world is going to pull through because you know that gives me hope as well <sighs> so um, before I get into it this um, so my keys got stolen a few months ago and I gave my mum a set of the new keys just in case I lock myself out, but, um, you need to live in this building to get like the master key, like the main, sec the security key for the front door. But the side door was busted, so I've just been getting into the building through there, so I didn't, like, replace the key. So anyway, I called up the property manager, and I said that I need a replacement key for the front door. And she said, no worries, just bring in your, your rental agreement, your photo ID, your, and your photo ID, and you can come in and pick the new key up. So I called my mum and I said, can you please um, give me a copy of the of the lease so I can, you know, get uh, get that key replaced. Then police sirens started going off. Now, there is some bullshit in regards to that. I know it. And then this came up on my page from Spiritual OG. Set up fast and sell anywhere. With After the ad. Fees, it's time to upgrade with Square Terminal. Okay, I just had to do this quick video. Real quick. They lied. They lied. They lied. They broke in. They lied. They lied. They lied. They lied. They broke in. That is why you're going to be in so much fucking trouble. It's because they broke into your home. They broke into your home. I repeat, they lied. They broke in. The paper is, there, there's, the paper's wrong. They broke into your home. So when I tell you that you, you people are in so much trouble, I really mean it. They broke into your home, sir. They broke into your home. And she said the paper is wrong because my mom and I are the only people whose names are on that lease. So, I found out about a specific murder in 2019. How many years ago is that? I don't even know what year it is now. 19, 20, 21. So, three, over three years ago. So, you're telling me that I willingly let a murderer into my home. Mm-hmm. Well, I know you've been breaking in anyway.
because that's what murderers do. They stalk people. They're sick. They're not normal. So, I've been carrying on and I've been talking about Luke being a murderer. Even Daisy said in one of her videos that Luke shoots people, does drive-by shootings for a living. I believe her because I am a key witness to a murder. So, if, I were, if I've been carrying on about Luke being a murderer, why the fuck would I have him on my lease? Or why would I willingly let him into my home and into my life? So when I get a copy of my lease tomorrow, I'm going to show everyone. Every damn shuffle. Great, they all fell out. Damn it. How does that make sense? Well, hang on, Spiritual OG said the paper is wrong. I think she means like the lease, like when you sign papers. Did you know that this? Okay, I just had to do this quick video, real quick. They lied, they lied. They lied. They broke in. They lied. They lied. They lied. They lied. They broke in. That is why you're going to be in so much fucking trouble. It's because they broke into your home. They broke into your home. I repeat, they lied. They broke in. The paper is, the, there's, the paper's wrong. They broke into your home. So when I tell you that you, you people are in so much trouble. I really mean it. They broke into your home, sir. They broke into your home. Yeah. Yeah, but you only break into my home when I'm not here. Because you know that if any of you came near me, I'd kill you.
And the Peppermint, <laughs> there's such a cute name, the Peppermint Tarot LLC said, don't let this MF anywhere near you. Final warning. See? Mm hmm. And the reason why I am detached in every sense of the word from Luke and that group is because I don't want to get caught up with them. I've already told you, I already explained what vicarious karma is. So, no thank you. Oh, my skin is unbelievably dry. So I'm going to moisturize my hands. In the meantime, since this is going on YouTube, weeks my god said six weeks is gonna do um this is daisy here aka this was before gavin newsom's recall last year so this was the 21st of no 17th of june question on hey priestess and i just had a quick message so um i this is for uh i saw you in my dream last night you're you're a european woman Okay, now, this is an important message for you, and I know it's important because my guides literally interrupted my whole Sky Day session just to give you this message, okay? Like, because it was getting really lit, and then, like, they immediately cut that shit off, and it's like, we, we got a message for you. Um, I don't know if maybe you have problems with maybe drinking or substance abuse, but what happened was we were in, sitting in a car. They, they, like, pulled me into your car, and I was sitting next to you, and you kept on falling asleep. I don't know if maybe, I don't know what was going on. Good morning. Then what ended up happening was um, I kept on trying to wake you up. I was like, are you okay? Wake up, wake up, wake up. And I just decided I, I like, carried you into the house. You were walking, but I was kind of, like, carrying you, too, like, helping you up the stairs and stuff like that. Then um, I put you in your room. And I put you in your room, and the funny thing is, two round dogs came in, like two the cutest puppies, like little mini pit bulls or something like that, or maybe a terrier, I don't know. I, I couldn't see the, uh, I couldn't really see the breed of the dog, but they were the cutest dogs ever, and they were all over you, they love you, etc. I don't know if you have dogs, but to see happy dogs in the dream state is, um, means to actually, uh, it means about companionship and things like that. Okay, so I don't know if you have a problem with substance abuse, and I don't know if you're listening, but you are important, and you need to be here. Um, you may be going through some traumatizing or troubling times, and you may feel like using is the only way, but it's not, okay? And you are so important that the Most High interrupted my Sky Day session to tell you this message, because you need to be here. And they told me that whatever you're going through, it's a part of your journey, that this is supposed to help you, um, that you're actually going to go into substance abuse counseling, you know, you're going to go into substance abuse counseling, you're going to be able to help other people with the things that you're going through, all right, so this may be for you or somebody that you may know, maybe it's a sister or a friend that you may know that, like, uses, so I, I just, I really, 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 um, encourage you, if this is you, if, if that's something that you're dealing with, Go on Patreon and do the addiction recovery uh, meditation. It's really powerful, okay? Get your dandelion and, and your other willpower oils and stuff like that. You're, you'll make it through. Harm reduction, right? Substitute the harder stuff for the lesser stuff, all right? Don't drink and drive, things like that. Call Lyft or call a designated driver, okay? But that's the message that my guides had for you. And like I said, that, that you're important because they interrupted my whole sky base session and that shit was getting lit. <sighs> It's okay. Hopefully tonight. Hopefully tonight. I'll see you tonight. I'll see you tonight. Okay. Now, next message. Um, 
have a message uh, regarding the uh, deep sea diving. So my guides told me, for those of you who know about what I'm talking about, the deep sea diving fuckery, one of the women that were put into the water, um, she was actually pregnant when that happened. And my guides told me that she, that was her last, like he was her last client, that she was looking to quit and things like that. She didn't know that she was pregnant. She was seven weeks pregnant. Seven weeks pregnant, you guys, when that happened. And that baby was supposed to be here. And that's, my guides are saying that that's why all you females that were getting um, impregnated by him, that's why you guys are suffering poverty and disgrace and shit like that right now. Because it's it, literally because what he did, he... It's like anything, any child that comes out of him or from him is going to be a sacrifice for the child that he took. And this karmic knows exactly what I'm talking about because when this fuckery all first popped off, I knew the energy was heavy, but I just did not know how heavy it was. Um, I'm going to post the original video on my Facebook page so you guys can see the reading and see all the cards and everything that's coming out. The fake text messages, all that stuff was coming out in there. All of it, the gang stalking, all of it came out in that original reading. And in that original reading, I said that Anubis was involved. I didn't know how deep it is because, you know, Anubis energy is not for play play. It's not for, for petty matters. So the fact that I called that Anubis was called on for some female that was starting to play with love spells, I was like, I didn't know that it was going to get that heavy. But that's why I got that heavy because of all the stuff that's coming out. Uh, Mississippi River Dream you had. Yeah, exactly. One of those females. So for the investigators that watch my channel, that's how you're going to be able to differentiate from the different ones. And all of them have dark hair. They're European women with dark hair. Okay. They look like his mom, like some 50 shades of gray shit. So, um, seven weeks. That's why all of that's why with this whole fuckery that happened, that's why there's a lot of you guys with children who are now having losing your jobs, having your reputation ruined, your health ruined, all that stuff. Because you sacrificed for children to help him hide what he was doing. And that's exactly why the whole entire situation blew up like this, because they had to see that I was actually telling the truth and I was a high priestess. So it was perfect that it actually happened this way, even despite all the fuckery and the madness. It was perfect that it happened this way. Now I have a message for you, Gavin, because I know you watch my channel. What you choose to do now within the next six weeks, my guide says six weeks is going to determine that recall campaign. Remember, you are a Libra. We're all about justice. Whether or not you're going to sit there and allow this fuckery to happen, you saw what he, you saw this motherfucker. You saw how trifling, trifling he is. You saw exactly how he gets down. So you know what he's capable of, Gavin. You know how far he will go to lie. That's why you're involved in this, so you can clearly see what's going on. Not so you can get fucking paid to help hide murder, murders and, uh, uh, and, and gang stalking and, and kidnappings. So that you can exercise your power as the fucking governor as the state of California to put that motherfucking in jail. Do your job. Again, what you do in the next six weeks is going to determine. That's what my guys told me. That is going to determine whether or not you're going to continue to be the governor for the state of California. Period. What you do in the next six weeks. Remember, you're dealing with Saturn. We're not dealing with the vote of the people. You are dealing with Big Daddy Saturn. And that's harsh. Now, there's, and notice how all the other people involved, even the low vibrational females, all of them are Libras. Notice. That's why this is all fucking happening. It's the energy of justice. Even though they're low vibrational, they still did their fucking job. Even though they were lying and scamming and all that stuff, they still did their job. So, you guys. Um, that's what I have for the deep sea diving update, and that's a, the uh, dream message that I had for you guys, okay? So, um, you guys are beautiful people, okay? I know it's early in the morning, but I had to get my groove on. I already made me a pot of soup. I'm about to go to the gym and get my, and get my freak on, all right? I hope you guys all have a good day, okay? Thank you so much for watching. Bye. Hmm. So, as I was playing this, Terry Joel Jr., just put, uploaded a video. It's called Why a Narcissist Will Gaslight You Into Being the Bad Person. Now, this is for the authorities. I'm going to show you a copy of my lease when I get that tomorrow. And I want you to watch that fat fuck, Luke. If he comes any, anywhere, I, I want a restraining order on him. You have to put a, a restraining order. I do not want him coming anywhere near my home. If he says I'm such a bad person, then why the fuck does he drive around my area?
drive around my apartment. Disgusting. First levels to this shit. Hang on. So again, this is called Why a Narcissist Will Gaslight You Into Being the Bad Person. These people are crazy, bro. These people are legit psychopaths. And there's levels to this shit, bro. There are levels to this insanity with these nerds. I'm going to explain exactly why. <clears throat> a narcissist will gaslight you into being a bad person. The reason why they do this, and like I said, there are levels to this shit. Some people are horrible. Some people are terrible. And the real reason why they do this is because they are terrible people and they know it deep down to their core. They know they're terrible. Like they know this. So if they can do something to trigger you, if they can do something to get under your skin, if they can do something to gain control over you, they will do it. They will bring up the most ridiculous things. Like the most ridiculous things to make you look ridiculous, to make you look like a bad person. It could be anything at all. You could be doing the right things and they'll make it look like you're doing something terribly wrong and they'll be calling you out, they'll be calling you down, they'll be saying this, they'll be saying that. And it's just ridiculous. The things that they actually do and come up with. It's gaslighting at its finest. They make you feel guilty. They make you feel like a bad person. And if you have no knowledge with this stuff, they might have success on you in doing these things. They are truly, truly evil. And the main reason, the main obvious reason as to why they do these things is because they are truly terrible fucking people. And they want to make you look really bad to make themselves look better. Because if they are the person saying crazy things to you want when you're just a regular person, you're doing right things in life or whatever. In the moment, you're doing you're, you're doing something that's right. And they'll start to like argue with you and bicker at you and make you feel some type of way. And in your mind, you're just thinking like, what? But they're drawing you into that loophole. Because if they can do that, it takes the attention off them and puts it on you, which is gaslighting at its finest. It's crazy making. It makes you feel crazy. Like, when these things happen, it makes you want to literally punch them in their head. Like, <laughs> hard. But, what you really should do is get away from them. Not engage. Not try to explain yourself. Not try to explain something. Not try to make them even look crazy because they already are and you know it. You don't have to do any explaining. You don't have to waste your time. You don't have to waste your energy. Just get away. Let them think whatever. They're evil anyways. They're going to think whatever they want. They could slander your name to other people. They could make people believe things about you that's not even true. They're just pure evil people. And they do all these things just because it takes it off themselves. It takes it off the ridiculous person that they actually are and puts it onto you. And what actually made me to what actually made me think to do this video was a situation that one of my friends was in with his sister. And I hung out with this guy pretty recently, a couple weeks ago, and he told me about this. And I had to make a topic about it. I'm not even gonna, I don't even really remember all that, what happened. 
but they were at the campground. They were at their camper. And this girl just started flipping out at this guy when this guy's girlfriend was around. Even his girlfriend told me that it was completely ridiculous what his sister did. That is another female calling another female ridiculous. So, if that's not proof, I don't know what else is. Crazy people exist. It is what it is. It was something so stupid too, like I don't even remember the full thing, but it was something so stupid that happened at the camper, at the campground, on site. On their site. And she just started like going at him like wide open. Making him look right crazy and stupid and all this stuff. It's because he's way more mature than she is. And she's older than him. And it just sounded really ridiculous to me, but I had to make a video on this to explain how it actually is and the effects that they have and what they do and why they do what they do is because they're the actual crazy ones doing that type of shit. It's draining to even think about, but I gotta tell the truth. It is the truth. These narcs are crazy. They're disgusting. It makes you, when, when you're around them, you, you, you wanna harm them. Because they psychologically harm you. They make your mind feel very bad. They do evil things to your mind. They make you feel evil. When they are around me, I feel evil because I want to harm them. Because there's a there's a devil in sight. I want to literally kill it. Literally. If I couldn't get away with it, I probably would. Get the fuck away from me before I literally snap your fucking neck. <laughs> But this is how they are. And if you actually ever did something to a narc, you get yourself in serious trouble because they will go to extreme lengths to do whatever they can do to get you in serious trouble. Some narcs will get you to hit them just so they can get you in serious trouble. There's a lot of women that have put men in prison, that have put men in jail for a long, long time because they provoked them into doing it. They're completely evil people. That's why I'm telling you guys to not deal with these fucking demons. You can't. You have to get away. You have to find a way to get away. Depending on the situation you're in, it could be really hard to get away, but you have to do it. And in other situations, it might not be that hard. <clears throat> it could be very easy. If you're not even really with the person, then you just kind of hung out with them once or something, and you're with them, and you find out who they are, it can be very easy to leave. But if they're a close person, if they are your own sister, like in this guy's case, he's going to see her sometimes. He's going to hang out with her sometimes. They're going to be at family gatherings together sometimes. Or a parent or something like this, it could be a little more difficult. But I always tell my people, that I work with that are in these situations to get the fuck out. I don't care if it's your goddamn mother, father, sibling, anything. If it's your spouse and you find out, I don't care what it is. You have to get away. You have to eliminate them, cut them off, keep them at bay. I do not deal with people like this, bro. I don't want to connect minds with you. I don't want to connect anything with you. I just want to be free. I don't want nothing to do with you. You make me feel crazy. You make me sound crazy. They draw like emotion out of you. They, they draw like the craziest shit out of you. And all while I'm explaining this, I can literally feel like what it's like. And, and, and it's crazy because that is how I am. When I talk about something, I can like feel it. And it's a very awful, awful, dark feeling is what it is. Gaslighting is terrible. Very, very, very terrible. Destructive. It 
brings something out of you. It brings a lot of you. It brings a lot of emotion, anger. Save time with Woolworth uh, Direct Ads. Uh, here to help you get your Woolies wet. Anxiety, fear, it brings a lot of things out of you because they are horrible people that do horrible things. And it's actually underrated how horrible it actually is. It's underrated. I'd rather get punched in the face. Probably many times than go through that kind of stuff. With someone that's always constantly around me all the time, all the time, all the time. It just, it just sucks the life out of you. Makes you feel disgusting. And it makes you want to harm them because whatever's around you is taking the life out of you. So you want to harm it so you don't feel that way. It makes sense. And I've felt it before in my life from certain people, from friends, from ex-partners. Not that much, honestly, from them. Not that much. And other things, too, that I'm not even going to mention. But it's abusive behavior. It's very selfish of them to do it. They're evil people. They want to pretend and act like they're good people, but they're absolutely not. They're disgusting. And you can't take them serious. They are at arm's length. You keep distance from them. You don't spend too much time with them. That is it. That is all you get. You're lucky you even get that. You're lucky you ever see my face again. You crazy bitch. <laughs> that is what it's like. These people are gone. They think there's a part of them that thinks they're normal. Some of them. Some of them know they're bad shit crazy. So they want to try to put the attention on you. They want to try to drive you crazy so you look crazy and seem crazy. So it takes it away from them so they look more normal for doing what they're doing. Which is crazy making. They create chaos out of nothing. They are destructive. They should be put on the electric chairs and executed. Like the olden days. Literally. Get the electric chairs out, bro. Get them out. Plug them in. Let's go. We gotta get them on those chairs right now. Right now. Before it's too late. They all should be put in some psych ward or something, though. They should be all locked up. The best torture would be to lock them up with each other. I would almost guarantee you somebody's life would come to an end. It would just be crazy. They are the definition of crazy. But this is my breakdown on gaslighting on its finest and why they do it. Not only what it is, but why they do it. To make you look fucking crazy. It's a whole part of gaslighting. I'll share one more example before I end this video. One time I was driving with a so-called friend. This guy actually used to be normal and he changed. He went through a whole bunch of stuff. Completely changed the person. Unrecognizable. His personality, his energy, unrecognizable. And he just became a mutt. But I remember, we were supposed to drive somewhere before I dropped him off. Back at his place. This was a long time ago. A long time ago. And I passed the road to his place because we planned on going somewhere else first. And I passed the road and we were going to keep going. We were going to go to this place. And he's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I was like, what? He said, we're going to go to this place. He said, I didn't say that. I, I told you to drop me off home. And he completely gaslighted the situation. Like, we literally agreed. He said first, let's go to this other place. Okay, let's do it. And we started going. And all of a sudden, he said that. And it just, I did not give a fuck. I'm like, okay. Stop, turn around, go back. 
but he tried to gaslight me. I didn't let it really affect me, but he did it. And it's the definition of what it is. Like they will literally say something so clearly, so clearly, and then say they never said it when we just said we were going to do it. In his mind, he probably changed his mind but didn't say nothing. And then we started going there. And in his mind, he wanted to like, like a kid. Oh, I want to go there no more. Oh, just take me home. But he never said anything. Like we literally passed the road and he probably made the decision in his head and said, I never said to go to that place. Yes, we fucking did. We literally just talked about it. So this is the thing they do. They're so fucking childish and immature. It's ridiculous, bro. But that is another example. And it's what they do. It's what they do. But anyways, that's the video. I hope you guys could take something from this video. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. On to the next. Next. Alright, so, no, I, I don't feel crazy. I feel sick to my stomach, actually. So, last night, no, not last night, it was the night before, um, I slept like rubbish because I was having a dream. I had a dream about the one of the murders. That was the sex worker, the, the prostitute that Luke ordered and killed her and dumped her body in the, and dumped her body in the water. Now, I kept waking up and I kept going like when I fell back asleep, I just like came back to the same dream. And I saw her in the water. Like, I saw her body in the water and she looked like she was still alive. So I went in to pull her out and she pulled me in with her and she drowned me. And I was so, like, I have a really big and painful rash on my back. It goes like all down to like my backside. I thought there were shingles, but I looked up on Google last night that you can't get shingles more than twice because I got shingles when I was 21 or 22, a long time ago. And I had a dream similar to that last month and I wet the bed because I was so terrified. My mom called me Mochka, which means a girl that wets herself. Mochko is, well, a boy that wets himself. So, like Mochka with the A is a girl that wets herself, but with an O at the end, it's a boy that wets himself. Moving on to what I'm actually supposed to be talking about. So, I pulled this just before when I was doing my cards. Now, I have been pulling this in every single read that I do. Now, the Three of Swords, Three of Swords upright is pain. Look at the card. Pain, see how there's like three swords going into that heart? Yeah. Hurt. Someone or something has pierced your heart. Creative or professional disappointment, which goes beyond mere hurt, into heartbreak. It can also be jealousy, hurt caused by a love triangle. Nothing subtle about this card, because pain is obviously an aspect of the human experience. Life is a contact sport. No one walking the planet can avoid this experience. Three of Swords, best course of action. Feel the feels. There is no way around it. If you don't admit the loss, the ache will remain. Fess up to being human. Acknowledge pain turns into something else. Anxiety, fear, depression, a frozen heart. So just be sad. So I currently am going through grief. Um, as I said in last night's video, I explained oh, my hair. I just put my um, grow thicker and fuller hair 
thickening treatment in. Um, so I just have to wait for it to dry. And, <sighs> feels a bit stiff. Um, so I told you last night why I'm currently heartbroken. I'm, I'm going through grief myself. So, um, like I said, in 2019, I found out um, about m the murder that I just spoke about. And after that, I was like, oh my god. I'm never, ever, ever going to be, like, you know, when you, like, oh, I, I, I still cannot, oh, I still can't believe it. I still cannot believe, like, this is real. So I was like, well, how the F am I ever going to fully let someone near me ever again after knowing that because like knowing that there are just such sick and twisted people out there it completely destroyed my belief in love altogether but from 2017 until like last year i really 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 and i mean really was into jack the 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 lead singer of city calm down and like i everyone knows that i follow professional high priestess daisy on her channel and she pulled out an angel oracle card in one of her readings and she said something like in order for you to love yourself, you have to let love in. So I was like, okay. I was like, fuck it. What the hell? So I just let Jack know in my own way, because I'm very, very socially awkward, um, that I am interested to have a date with him to see if we click. Then there was just, uh, you know, there was drama, so I was like, ah, it freaked me out. So then I was just looking at other people, and then I remembered I on my perf page, um, there was pictures of Peter Steele from Type of Negative, and I've always been a fan of Type of Negative since I was little, um, but... I found out that he passed away in 2010. In 2010, <laughs> oh, I was dating that weirdo. Oh, I was dating this guy called Sean in 2010 for like, we stayed together for a while. We were on and off for two years as well. And so, he wasn't he wasn't into the same music that I was and so I didn't know that Peter had passed away in 2010. So um since then I've just fallen more and more <laughs> in love with him just from watching interviews and stuff he's just he's just perfect. Of course he had his imperfections, but like I said, um that wabi sabi that Japanese thing it's the perfections within the imperfections okay so um yeah I feel really dumb because on Halloween like I was convinced that he was going to come to my apartment and we're going to spend the night together so I cleaned up the apartment did my waxing and everything and I stayed up I was watching oh it's Nightmare Before Christmas and Hocus Pocus and he just didn't show up so I was just devastated I know I know how dumb that sounds, 
But when I woke up the next day, I was like, yeah, I felt really, 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 really dumb. But anyway, because I've been listening to his music, I listen to his music all the time. I think about him all the time. He's like the first thing that I think about when I wake up and the last thing that I think about before I go to sleep. Anyway, so I was listening to this song, September Sun, with, you know, type of negative, and how he says, leave her alone. I said, leave her alone. <laughs> So that's just something that he has left me with. So that's really beautiful, really sweet. I'm going to cherish that always. But of course I have a beautiful support network. So before I went to bed last night, I was just checking my Instagram. Um, and Michelle Trachenberg um, from Buffy and Gossip Girl and Seventeen again and Harriet the Spy, she put something lovely and she put on her stories, knowing that I was going to see it. There is no elevator in healing. You have to take the stairs. And Karamo from Queer Eye, he's a counsellor, so I just saw this and he said, a reminder, you are the shit. Well, guess what time it is? It's time for me to remind you that you are the shit. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise, because you are, and you deserve the best. I'm also coming out here to remind you that if you're any... And a reminder to vote for Queer Eye for their Emmys. So, I've got a beautiful support network, and now I'm going to create a support network, because as um, I just read, that pain is just the most normal human experience we all we, we we all go through it at some point in our life so this is going to help me um for other people that are currently grieving and in the future you can always come back to this i'm going to be uploading this onto my channel now i was watching oh, i love that show never have i ever I'm always so excited when they upload uh, a new season on, on Netflix. It is the bomb.com. It's, I love it. Um, so definitely check that out if you haven't already. It's the best. Um, so in that show, Davy, the girl, I love her. She is awesome. She, uh, her father passed away and you know, in, we're into the third season now and she's still mourning the death of her father and in that show someone said to her 
like you know grief is just the price that you pay for love so grief can um like grief comes from well you know pain so either heartbreak or losing someone that you love like that dies so um this is just some advice from russell brand how i got over heartbreak so if you are currently going through heartbreak or in the future have you had your heart broken are you experiencing heartbreak are you wondering what this heartbreak can do to you oh, it's a terrible revelation to know that you have invested your well-being in another person and that life hasn't gone the way that you wanted it to go I've experienced heartbreak for most of my life. When I think now, because now, look, I'm in my 40s, so I can look back at heartbreak when I was 15, heartbreak when I was 12, heartbreak when I was 11, heartbreak in my 20s and 30s, you know, like sort of right into, like, to when I got married, just getting my heart broken again and again. Now, I reckon in my case, it was because I like to be in the outside, you know? I'm by I default to drug addiction and alcoholism, I'm not good at sitting with myself. So when I meet someone illuminating and exciting, I invest in them. I invest in them in silent obsession, zeal and devotion, feelings that would be better spent on some true and formless God rather than some temporal flesh one. I think because I'm on tour at the moment, I'm in Australia, I'm remembering like the various times where on the road I've fallen in love. I know I have a reputation for being promiscuous and I was a promiscuous person. But also I used to really fall in love with people. I remember falling in love with someone in Sydney and walking along the harbour and trespassing into a bit of the Sydney Opera House and a security guard coming around with a flashlight and shining it on me and her. We weren't doing anything. It was sort of a romantic sort of looking out over the harbour thing. Shining a flashlight on us and going, Oh, it's you, is what he said, or something like, ah, oh, it's you, and then he sort of smiled and left us there. And I, um, but it was so um, vivid and real, elevated from life. You know, look, there's a the kind of heartbreak where you're married to someone for 20 years and then you find out they've been having an affair or whatever. You know, that's like, this is a fathoms deep rupture in the geography of your life, where you have houses and history that have all now got to be cast asunder that's a kind of a well that heartbreak i mean this is again a kind of death i suppose i think of when i think of the word heartbreak i imagine it being a kind of temporary experience that's due to an illusory projection of spiritual feelings onto a not that a human being is a material object that's probably part of my problem but a non to if we uh, if we designate the non-sacred sacred qualities, i.e. worship false idols, we will suffer. Many spiritual or indeed religious ideas have behind them a kind of truth that's there to guide us. Not just dogma, it's not always, women do this, don't do that, don't have that kind of sex, don't do that. It's not only that, I admit, it's not my job to admit, it seems that that is part of some... Uh, Abrahamic, some monotheistic, some, you know, some ideologies do have uh, oppression in them, not least capitalism and democracy. But, but unless we have a route to the sacred, unless we have a, but there, but, but there are also in religions clear, clear, positive and truthful information, like don't worship false idols, not because otherwise God will smite you, but because you will discover that false idols can't heal you, can't save you, can't hold you. If you make the non-sacred sacred, suffering is coming, suffering is coming. So I would say, if you broke your heart, you're going to have to spend a little bit of time on yourself. What about the things that you've never considered doing? A fearless and thorough inventory, a real commitment to changing direction, silent retreats, meditation. You don't need to go down this path again. The real heartbreaking thing is, is that you'll probably continue to experience heartbreak unless you alter your patterns and habits and examine the reason why you continually or, you know, just in this instant are experiencing it i suppose heartbreak is an enormous subject despair loss heartbreak the motivator of so much art and poetry because if in that rupture in that separation in that severance from oneness in that feel that feeling of being cast out of the eden of love great poetry comes from that great beauty comes from that from that 
articulate despair. But for me, I've been whooped and whipped and cowed by life to the point where I can only apply sacred devotion to the sacred, which for me means the uh, formless oneness behind all material phenomena, present also in consciousness, individually but collectively, the relational communal mind between us built on our myths and stories, this interconnectivity. If you have some kind of relationship with that, then you are able to deal with heartbreak and death and loss and all of the other painful sad things that this veil of tears is beset with. Hmm. Um, actually, before this, I, um, you know, went through that really brutal miscarriage in 2018, after not even knowing that I was pregnant anyway, um, and I was devastated. I was just, uh, I was an absolute mess. Um, and Russell Brand came out with this on dealing with grief and he actually got me through that he um I perform at my bed I mean like I'm never ever going to fully get over it but he helped me move on with my life instead of just like you know dwelling over it dwelling on it because I wasn't moving forward with my life I was just sad all the time Grief. It is said that grief is the price we pay for love, that if we are going to love people and adore them, that grief is an unavoidable consequence of that. Most commonly, of course, we associate grief with death, but is death not a continual process rather than one definitive act? Today, I grieved the moment my little daughter went to a play school for the first time, recognising it is but one moment in a series of forthcoming moments of letting go of her as she moves towards adulthood and I myself move towards the grave. Grief, of course, in relation to actual death, bereavement, painful, painful process which blessedly I've not been confronted with directly for a while. We lost a friend of ours quite recently as she died, as she was dying, when the final death came, there was an exhalation, as there often is, with death after long illness, the relief of death. Using the process of terminal decline for a time where we can convey love and importance, where we can attune ourselves into what we truly believe in, the reality of the relationship, allowing relationship to be a place where love thrives, where truth flourishes, rather than a place of unawareness and unconsciousness, means at least that when someone dies, they can die knowing that you love them. Sudden, sudden death, different thing, and the need for acceptance profound and painful because we cannot resist actuality when someone is gone someone is gone and they have to live on in your memory of them and the rituals that you create around them think of the things that they loved Think of the things that they would have you do and do them, commemorate them, allow them to live on in the choices that you make, in the way that you live lovingly, in the way that they would have you do. Grief is a painful and necessary part of life, for if we know one thing of life, it is the inevitability of death. Is life not but death in waiting? Is therefore grief not a necessary component of our joy and love of ongoing life. Embrace grief and know that it will pass. Thank you. Hello, I'm doing these new videos more frequently now. Please hit the notification button at the end of this video because then you'll get a, like a little bell when uh, I post a new video and I'd like you to get a little bell when I post a video and then I can, I don't know, be buzzing away in your pocket. Sounds like a <laughs> mosquito. Anyway. All right, this is grief expert on death and how to cope because I'm not an expert at all <laughs> This is Paramount Plus. This is six festivals, five bedrooms, four
An aspect of the pandemic that we don't much discuss is that many of us are living in a form of grief. Having lost many experiences, not to mention potentially loved ones, we're entering into a space we're unfamiliar with. In this conversation, I speak to David Kessler, an authority on grief, about the five stages of grief and the way that they vary and mutate and are expressed through individual grieving processes, that his personal experiences with loss and how you can handle grief, mourning and pain and suffering, even that's not necessarily related directly to the death of a human being, differently and hopefully better. I'm scared of grief. I'm scared of it. Like, you know that famous maxim of, like, uh, grief is the price we pay for love? Like, sometimes with my animals, I remember it with my cat that uh, he died last year. I remember that, and, you know, with, uh, like, you know, with pretty much everybody, actually, I sort of, like, try to conceive of their death while I'm with them. I try to, sort of, both from a perspective of acceptance, but also in a kind of weird infatuation way. Is there a positive way of sort of mobilising that idea, accepting the inevitability of uh, literal and bodily death without it becoming, like, sort of obsessive and fetishistic or something? Well, I think I've had to adopt a different view of all that. First of all, there's a, a healthy thing called anticipatory grief, that when a pet's getting older, or when our parents are getting older, we, we sort of know we're going to lose them someday and have this healthy adaption that our mind is trying to grapple with. Um, so that's the healthy part of it. I certainly, dealing with this my whole life, have had to really reckon with love and grief are a package deal on planet Earth. Grief is actually optional. You don't want to grieve ever. You don't have to. But you can't fall in love. You can't have friends. You can't attach to pets. You can't love your children or your parents. When I realize all that, I'm like, well, I don't want to make the journey without love. I mean, I want to come here and love, and it means I'm going to lose someday. I'm going to lose the people I love, the pets I love, the things I love. That's that's part of this this travel we all do. Can you tell us about your formative experience of grief, the loss of your mother, and then how the uh, the later grief, the loss of your son, um, which I'm obviously sorry to hear about, and I know your mother of course, but you know, especially the loss of a child. Um, can you ex tell me how those two experiences of grief differ and how they affected and changed you and how you dealt with them? Sure. You know, it's, it's, I'm in a profession that in some ways you don't choose, it kind of chooses you. You know, no third grader is like, oh, I want to be a death and a grief expert when I grow up. You know, I had a mother who was ill when I was growing up, and when I was about 13, she had to go to the hospital in the big city because she was uh, very sick. I didn't know she was dying. And at the time she was dying, at the hotel across the street where we were, uh, a shooting began, and it turned out it was one of the first mass shootings in the U.S. It's tragic we have them all the time now, but it was one of the first big ones. And in the span of three days, I wasn't able to be with my mother when she died. I saw hotel guests, police officers, and the chief of police died. And it's now used as what not to do in a shooting because... They made so many mistakes. They just didn't know how to handle it at the time. And, and there was also racial overtones to it and so much of what we still deal with today. And that changed the trajectory of my life. I, you know, tried to heal myself, tried to, there was no one there to help me with the trauma, with the grief. So that began my life of trying to help myself, help others. I was fortunate to work with some amazing people. My teacher became Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who is a pioneer in the hospice world, along with your Cicely Saunders there in the UK. And they started hospice in our world. And um, uh, she obviously um, came up with the five stages of dying. Over the years, I would talk about Elizabeth, those stages are getting badly used for grief. And finally, we wrote a book called On Grief and Grieving, where we adapted her stages from dying to grief. The stages, for anyone not familiar with them, are denial, 
anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. We literally on page one of the book said you don't do them in order. They're not a map. There's no one way to do grief. It's unique as our fingerprint. And it's interesting over the years how they've changed because they've become these five easy steps for grieving. And Elizabeth and I both hated that then and I hate it now. There's no five easy steps for grieving. And uh, it's interesting on social media, sometimes people will put in, oh, you and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross are just trying to neaten up our grief and make us follow your rules. And Elizabeth was a rule breaker. Elizabeth would hate this idea that there's these stages you're supposed to follow. So they've gotten a bad rap. The other thing is acceptance got a finality that we never intended. You know, when people say to me, how long am I going to grieve my loved one who died? I always go, well, how long is your loved one going to be dead? Because if they're going to be dead a long time, you're going to grieve them a long time. It doesn't always mean with pain. Hopefully in time you can grieve them with love. So that's kind of the background on the stages and a lot of my work. Um, and then, as you mentioned a few years ago, after doing this for decades, I had adopted two children, four and five years old, from the L.A. County foster care system. My younger son was um, uh, born drug exposed, and I really thought love would conquer all. And they had this amazing childhood. And it really was beautiful. I was shocked at sort of their turnaround and how well they were doing in life. And then at 16 years old, my son David called me one night and said, I'm in trouble. And I said, what's up? Where are you? What's going on? And he goes, I've used drugs. And I said, okay. And in my mind, I'm like, did you have a couple of beers? Did you have some pot? What did you do? And I go, well, what'd you do? What's going on? And he goes, I did crystal meth. And I'm like, wait, wait, you're starting with crystal meth? And it was a hard road to comprehend. And I have certainly in my life been in program, been when Al-Anon, I, I sort of Got it from my older perspective, but not this new world we're living in. And uh, I, we spent the next four years, him going in and out of rehab and 12-step programs, and just a tumultuous road, a horrendous road as anyone who's had to deal with knows. And uh, he got sober. He was doing well, had his 21st birthday, had a wonderful girlfriend who was a social worker. And literally, I would say to him, David, I am seeing so many bereaved parents from addiction these days. Promise me I will never be a bereaved parent. And he's like, you will never be a bereaved parent. I'm sober now. And even when I wasn't, I knew what I was doing. And got the call one day that he, his girlfriend, had had an argument that any 21-year-old has, called up some old friends, they went out and used, they lived, he died. Brutal. What gets me is, like, the sort of mundanity of it, you know, like, that it's not, it's just normal people doing normal stuff. Like, like kids take drugs, kids have arguments, and I've been around it because of my own recovery. I've been around it all my life because I was a drug addict from like, you know, my late teens to my sort of till I was 27, and I've been in recovery one day at a time since then. And so, people dying as a result of their drug use. Or associated mental health issues, or you know, obviously, you know, if you know how many ways that can play out, it's become sort of normal. 
And um, because of that, because of that, I like, feel like I want to be able to, as obviously you obviously master when you said that thing. I promise, I'm promise me, I'm not going to be a bereaved parent. You want to be able to wrench it away. You want to wrench it away. There's been a few drug addicts where I've gone like, I oh, you know what I've always found. I don't know how this ch- tries with your deeper experience, but like. Like the, almost like the more I sort of go, listen, this person definitely not. I'm gonna put myself as a shield between this person and the grave. Then ones they're finished. You know what I mean? It's almost like I, the, the, the inability to control it, the inability to understand it, pre- predict it, prevent it. I don't like. In, you obviously sort of indicated at the beginning of your story that there's possibly a fact of the early exposure prior to your son living with you is a factor. How how did you begin to process under, and understand and, and and accept your the, the loss of your son? I had it, you know it was really hard because I had to sit with, am I going to take the advice I gave everyone? And my advice was go to grief counseling, huh. grief group, and I had to literally go to a grief group took my contacts out, put my glasses on, put a cap on. I had to sit in grief groups with literally my books four feet away on a table. Wow. And not say, that's me. I'm the expert. I couldn't be him. I had to sit there and be the father who had to bury a son. That was a pretty humbling thing to have to do. I mean, it was, I, I, now, because of those experiences, when people walk into one of my grief groups or come online on a grief group or show up for counseling, I applaud now because I know now how hard it is just to walk in that room. I never got that before. If you're enjoying this conversation, join me over at Luminary for the rest of our discussion. And for all the latest episodes of Under the Skin, go to luminarypodcast.com to start your free trial. See you there. Whew. Uh, this is, I found this video, five things about grief, no one really tells you. Ooh, well, no one's, ooh, I haven't seen this before. Psych2Go is a digital media organization that raises mental health awareness by presenting psychological topics in a digestible and relatable manner. Please share our content with those who need it. It's a great way to show your support to us as well. Most people know the common five to seven stages of grief. Shock, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, testing, and acceptance. Everyone experiences these stages in entirely different ways. While you're grieving, many people will tell you something along the lines of, stay strong, or it'll get better. While those are predictable and well-intentioned things to say in an attempt to comfort someone, they're not always true. When I was younger, I experienced more than my fair share of grief. And after years of reflection, I've come to understand that there is more to grieving than most people realize. I would like to share with you five things about grieving that I desperately wish someone would have shared with me. One, we grieve for more than the dead. Yes, the death of a human being is the most common source of grief, but it's not the only one. You can experience the whole force of grief for anything important to you. You can grieve the loss of a pet. You can mourn the loss of a sentimental object, the loss of a beloved place, or of any kind of relationship or connection. Nothing has to die in order for you to go into mourning. There can be grief for a friendship that has just drifted apart, or for the ending of your favorite book series, a home that you've had to move away from. You can grieve for yourself. When you grow and change as a person, pieces can be left behind old bits of a personality and mannerisms that we can ache for all the same. Whenever something is lost, no matter what, no matter why, and it causes pain in its absence, that is grief. Two, just stay strong typically goes hand in hand with the denial phase of grief. It's when you're told that despite all the terrible things happening to you, you must stay strong and overcome it. What is not said is that just stay strong should mean when you're done properly grieving, you will still be alive. This will not kill you. You are stronger than your tragedy. Instead of pretend like nothing's wrong, 
Don't let your tragedy affect you. Just keep living regardless. Denial is usually said to be the first or second stage of grief. If you find yourself stuck there, you will never eventually get to acceptance, and you will never really be out of your cycle of grief. It's okay to not be strong. That's what people should tell you when you're beginning to grieve. It's all right to cry, to scream, to take time away. It's understandable to feel weak for a bit, so long as you learn to let that weakness go. You do not have to stay strong. If you do, moving on may become difficult. Weakness and vulnerability is part of the grieving process, and it should be accepted. Three, there should be a guilt phase of grief. Often when we lose something, those of us that are still here feel a sense of guilt. Some people feel left behind. Some feel survivor's guilt, in which they believe they should also be gone, or should have died in the other's place. Some simply regret what they missed out on before the end. They regret something they said or did, or the lack thereof. We find a way to place the blame on ourselves, find a way to make circumstances our fault, even when it's not. Facing death often precedes a re-evaluation of life. It's only natural that we question things in our time of grief. It's normal to find regrets. You're always going to feel like you could have done something. You're not weird or unhealthy to feel a sense of guilt, but you need to learn to let it go eventually. There's nothing to gain from holding on to it. Instead, turn that guilt into nutriment for what is still alive. Learn from your regrets and use them as a guide to ensure that you live the life you have to the fullest. Four, time means little to the act of grieving. It does not heal all wounds, but merely smooths them over, making it easier to forget their presence. It'll get better is nice, though not necessarily true. And that's okay. There are some things that'll never really go away. Some scars never fade, but that's a fact of life and part of you. It's normal to still be haunted by things that happened long ago, to still grieve years later. Do not be down on yourself for being emotionally caught up in the past sometimes. You can't just ignore trauma and tragedy and hope that it'll go away. Nothing fixes itself. To heal requires treatment, whether that be through outside assistance or internal reflection. Acceptance will not just roll around to you. You have to get there yourself. Five, acceptance is more complicated than just admitting to a loss. Acceptance is not a finish line. There is no real finish line with grieving because grief is not a marathon. Rather than a straight shot to the end, it's a winding and confusing maze. Nor is it a one and done thing. More than likely, you will find yourself going through the cycle of grief several times throughout your life. And chances are, you will grieve the same thing more than once. You can regress, and that's perfectly okay. You could be done with grieving for years when suddenly something triggers you and you have to go through it all over again. This usually happens if you did not let yourself grieve properly the first time, but it can still happen to those that have had the proper closure. We're never really done with grieving. We will grieve for as long as we live. The cycle of grief goes hand in hand with the cycle of life, but that is nothing to be afraid of. In order to accept our losses, we must accept the cycle of grief for all that it is. We hope you enjoyed this video. And if you're grieving, we hope that you fully allow yourself to do so. Or maybe you know someone who's grieving. Share this video with them. As always, thanks for watching. Oh yeah, when she said that one of the stages of grief is anger, I remember with this video, it's really, really, really difficult to watch. It's um, mum confronts men who dismembered her daughter. Oof. her daughter's killer. You had no right to take her from me! 
Christine Young tore into the man who committed an unspeakable act, murdering her daughter Ashley and then dismembering her body. I cry seven days a week! Seven! As the enraged mother spoke, a box containing her daughter's ashes sat on the table beside her. This is what's left of my daughter. If I want a hug, I have to hug a box and close my eyes and pretend that she is hugging me back. When Ashley first went missing, her mom was suspicious and contacted Ashley's friend, Jared Chance. Do you remember texting me? I would never, never do anything to hurt her. I swear on my life. Do you remember that? Do you? Ashley was already dead and dismembered when you text that to me. Cops found Ashley's torso in the basement of Chance's home in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Prosecutors believe he used this power saw to dismember her. He has refused to reveal what happened to Ashley's head, hands, and feet, which are all still missing. The killer stood stone-faced as Christine Young unloaded on him, wearing a t-shirt reading, Mom of Angel Ashley. I hate you. I want to rip you limb from limb. And discard you like trash. Like what you did to Ashley. Chance was sentenced to, get this, 200 years in prison. The judge said he should not be eligible for parole until he turned 130 years of age. Take him to prison, please. The sentence is little consolation for this heartbroken mom. You had no right to take her from me! Yeah, you can you can hear the pain in her voice. So, of course, when so someone that you know um, is going through something, is grieving, um, if they are like that, just let them go. Just just let them get it all out. Don't tell them to quieten down. Just just. Oh, uh, and you know if you if you live in an apartment complex like I do. Just go and apologize to the neighbors. Just say, look, this happened to my friend or this happened to my brother, my sister, or whoever. They're going through a difficult time. I'm so sorry about the inconvenience. Every time I apologize, like, for playing loud music, my neighbors say they, they never hear it. So, you know. Now, um, when I was scrolling through my homepage, this song by him just came up on my thing don't close your heart now i saw that when i got up from my nap this afternoon because i was just well by the time i finished filming last night it was around two in the morning so i don't know what time it usually, it usually takes me a while to wind down after work so i think i went to sleep around three and i woke up at ten and then from when I woke up, I just started crying again and I exhausted myself. So I had to go down for a nap. And so I did. But, you know, I had to listen to it. It made me feel a lot better. It was like, baby, don't close your heart. Darling, don't let me down. Now, as Michelle Trachenberg put on her um, Instagram stories... I forgot what it is already. Self-love. There is no elevator in healing. You have to take the stairs. Of course. So, um, you know, with, with that song as well, Don't Close Your Heart. To be loved, you also have to let love in. Okay, so you have to love yourself. You have to give yourself that love and care and nurturing and of course accept it from other people you know that song um by steam steam by e17 that love will love will love you love can feel you love can hear you love can love can warm you love will help you love won't harm you So 
so um like 2018 I had the brutal miscarriage then 2019 oh it's really hot in here that's why my face is going red <laughs> I, the heater um which makes me like that makes me sad as well because like it's the middle of it's the 20th of August so that means that we only have a couple of days like we have 30 so we have 11 days left of winter and then we're on to spring and then it goes on to summer and I hate summer and then um 2019 I tried to get pregnant again had another miscarriage because of stress um then 2020 I lost both of my grandparents they passed away within um a couple of months of each other and then last year I found that the person that I really 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 am in love with or really 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 want to be with um is also dead so I've like been through a lot of grief and a lot of pain over the last couple of years so as Russell Brand said uh, that's the best advice that he gave me was just to be the best version of myself that I can be for my passed on loved ones to commemorate them so that their memories so that their mem so that their memory can also live on so like you know when people go through grief and loss they can turn into like you know go into a downward spiral they can go into drugs and alcohol and addictions and that can just make their lives even worse so that's just why I want to be the best that I can for them to make them proud of me yeah because I don't think that they would be happy if they saw me like because essentially like you know addiction just just kills you so they wouldn't want to watch me kill or harm myself so so don't I, I don't ever want to hear anyone say like you when they've been through a heartbreak or grief that they never want to love again because of you know there's always the risk like it's inevitable we are all going to die you know that song by type of negative every everything dies <laughs> I'll play it a little bit so this is how Peter dealt with his pain when he lost both of his parents
Aww. So that's really sad, but yes, everything dies. Nothing lasts forever, unfortunately. So I definitely haven't closed myself off from love. Of course, I do want to get married and have a family. I just cry all the time and I don't think anyone wants to be around someone that just cries all the time. So, you know, that's like, <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't like it. I know. So, I don't know, I guess, um, I guess next bay, you know, we'll know that I'm just moving on from someone that I really, 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 really do love. And of course now I'm grieving because like even more because like I am almost at the acceptance stage. I have to accept that that's how it is. And I have to let go, but I don't want to because <laughs> it's not healthy. But I think I'm a little bit like, yeah, I think I'm um, far, like, you know, I still have a little bit to go anyway before I can start dating again because I, like, this shit has to be completely over and done with and behind me. Uh, <laughs> So, <laughs> like uh, Daisy said in a video that I have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with comics in the near future. Oh, God. So, I have to get through that first. So, this just came up on my page from Professional High Priestess Daisy. Crazy until you're... Crazy until you are right. Well, I don't talk about anything unless I can back myself up. So, I don't really care what people think. Like, things have to come out. Like, the truth always comes to surface. Anyway. But I wonder what blew up now while I, while I was making this video. <laughs> um, so, yeah. This is the best I can do. Like, I'm only human. I'm not a grief expert. Um, but as long as this helps just even... If this video helps even just one person, then that is time well spent. I'm that that makes me really happy. Um, so I'm going to leave it here for this evening. Um, I'm sad, grieving, and tomorrow I'll be back with a copy of my lease to show the investigators. Um, and I also have to talk about another issue that is quite serious. Um, but yeah, until then, I hope everyone is having a lovely weekend and I'll see you tomorrow night.